This is a sign of progress. Crews are hard at work making Grand Teton Drive a safer place when our valley sees rain. And on this special edition of the Flood Channel, we'll take a look back at some of this year's biggest stories. And as you can imagine, Grand Teton Drive has been stealing all of the headlines. The August 25th storm that hit the valley dropped more than a year's worth of rain in just three hours. This after the Carpenter One fire wiped out most of the mountain's ability to handle runoff. This storm was the worst of several rainfall events this monsoon season and the most rain we've seen since the district's creation in 1985. But despite all of this rain, the flood control system worked. Homes and businesses were saved and no lives were lost. Unlike past events in the Northwest, flooding was mostly contained to street flooding. There's a saying in the district's office that Mother Nature always seems to rain where we're not yet ready for her. And nowhere is that more apparent than what we saw on Grand Teton Drive. The Flood Control District's master plan is a massive document that outlines all of the flood control infrastructure that spider webs across Clark County. And though we're 75% complete with that master plan, we still have a long way to go. What that means is there are parts of Clark County that are not yet equipped to handle floods of this magnitude. Well, at detention basins in general, we use those to capture large storm flows that generally are coming out of mountainous areas. We capture those flows into a, a basin and we release those flows downstream at a, a more controlled flow rate, a less damaging flow rate. And that's what we did with the Kyle Canyon Detention Basin. There's about a 57 square mile area that drains to that detention basin. The basin functioned beautifully. Um, it captured the flows that were coming out of the mountains. It detained those flows. It did release them in a, in a more controlled manner, a less damaging manner downstream. The water level rose in the detention basin to about 27 feet over about a four hour period. Uh, we estimated that about uh, 1,300 acre feet of water drained into that detention basin, which is about 40% of the volume. So less than half of the detention basin volume was used during this storm event. Could have handled a bigger storm if, if indeed that did occur. Uh, but still, uh, 1,300 acre feet is a lot of water. It's a, about a football field size, one foot deep is an acre foot, and we had 1,300 of those. So if you can imagine 1,300 football fields, one foot deep, that's how much water is stored in that basin. It's critical for us to be able to drain the basin, though. We have to be able to get the water out of the facility uh, in a timely manner because there's an, always a chance that we'll have another storm event occur right after that first storm event, and that can cause us some problems. So generally we want the basins drained within seven days after the storm event. The Kyle Cannon Detention Basin was built in, in the mid-90s. Um, and when this basin was built, there was really no development downstream at that time. When we built it, we, we designed it to drain into one of the existing washes that was there. There was no development, there were no roadways to be impacted at that point in time. But as often happens, development caught up to us and roads were built without the benefit of a storm drain system in them. And so that water, instead of running in a wash, actually ran down roadways. During the August 25th storm at the Kyle Canyon Detention Basin, uh, uh, quite a bit of water was captured by the detention basin, about 25 times the amount of water that was released from the detention basin. So um, we did have water flowing down the road and it did flow for a prolonged period of time. And that was the, the basin actually functioning just the way it's supposed to. We, we have to capture that flow and we have to release it somehow. So we have to provide some sort of outfall for that facility. And that outfall in this case drained down to, to Wallapai and it actually eventually you know, ran over some roadways during that process. This was a, a bit of a, a unique setup uh, because we had remnants of Tropical Storm Evo moving up and uh, the leading edge of the moisture that was associated with that storm was just moving into the Las Vegas area that afternoon. Uh, in this case, the storm lasted, instead of lasting an hour or maybe two hours, it lasted uh, in its strongest state for about four or five hours. The storm formed over Kyle Canyon and then as the cold air uh, began to increase underneath the storm, it actually pushed the storm over the valley. And that just put more rain on top of the runoff that was flowing downhill. So you have rain on top of runoff, which just adds more to the flood wave. If the detention basin wasn't in place, it would have been a disaster for the Northwest area. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of homes would have been flooded. We had roadways that were impacted, but really all the roads in the Northwest area would have been impacted by this flow had uh, that detention basin not been in existence. The duration of this storm was, was longer and it was more intense than what we saw in 2003. So the amount of runoff we got from that storm was quite a bit greater than what was seen going down Gallon, for example, in 2003, probably two and a half times. Even though the Las Vegas Valley as a whole didn't receive that much rain, we still had 
significant, extreme flooding in portions of the valley due to rainfall that fell away from the valley. A lot of times we get our, our flash flooding on Mount Charleston with an inch to two inches, and we, we'll get flash flooding up there. In the Las Vegas Valley, for instance, it only takes a third to a half an inch to produce minor flooding. Once you get up to an inch, you can have some pretty pretty devastating flooding in areas. Um, so when you, when you start talking about uh, four to six inches, it's, it's just uh, more along the lines of catastrophic flooding. Most of the rainfall with this event did not fall on the Carpenter One fire. It fell just to the northeast of the Carpenter One burn area. However, it doesn't take very much rain for there to be flooding associated with the Carpenter fire. So when you have a, a, a major wildfire like the Carpenter One burn area was, it gets rid of all the vegetation, and basically there's nothing that inhibits uh, the water from flowing downhill. And so the flash flooding happens much more quickly, and it can bring a lot more debris downhill with it. The Las Vegas Valley is a bowl, and it all flows from the higher terrain to the west, and it all drains out through Henderson and into Lake Las Vegas and eventually into Lake Mead. So even if you have stuff in Mount Charleston, eventually it'll get to Henderson and into Lake Las Vegas. In addition to all the flow that was captured, um, quite a bit of sediment and debris was captured as well. Um, part of the drainage area that drains into this basin is in the burn area from the Carpenter One fire, so there was soot and ash in the flow, uh, along with branches and trees and everything else you can imagine in storm flows. And all that debris was captured by the, uh, by the detention basin and kept there instead of going downstream. In a perfect world, we would like to, to build the detention basin and build the outfall for the detention basin all the way down to some facility that can handle it downstream, but we're constrained by budgets. And so what we wind up doing is building things pieces at a time. The first step we, we built here was the detention basin, and it provides a lot of benefit despite the fact that there's flows going down portions of roadways uh, coming out of this basin. It still provides a lot of benefit by capturing that, that huge storm event coming out of the mountains. The media has their eyes on the skies and their ears to the ground during flash floods. And they're a key partner in educating residents about the dangers of flash flooding. But we learned in this story that journalists aren't just reporting the news. Often, they're saving lives. Getting the right information during a flash flood could mean the difference between life and death. At the district, we provide safety information, but it's partners in the media that make sure the message really gets heard. The twofold mission of the district, certainly on the construction side, we build the facilities to keep the waters away from people and property, but as importantly, the communication and awareness message to keep people away from those floodwaters. Best thing I can do today, and some of the speakers have already mentioned it, is to thank everybody. First and foremost, the member agencies. We hear often about the uh, jurisdictional battles between our county and our sister cities, but the Regional Flood Control District learned a long time ago that floodwaters don't care about jurisdictional boundaries. And to have the county and the cities come together and truly build a regional program has been a remarkable success and certainly demonstrated with some of the facts and figures you've heard today. Uh, to our friends at the Weather Service, always been there for us. Greatly appreciate that. And our media friends, from uh, not only back of the house to our camera folks, to our reporters, the anchors, the meteorologists, uh, you've been there for a long time. And not just reporting events, but helping us critically in getting that critically important message out as far as education. We thank you because without everybody's effort, uh, we would not have been success as successful as we have to date. Local journalists have a critical role to play during flash flood season. The media is on the ground covering a flood as it happens to be sure residents have the best, most up-to-date information. Oftentimes, journalists put themselves in the thick of an event to be sure the viewers can see just how dangerous a flood can be. A photojournalist is going to go out there, it's exactly what it is. A photojournalist is, you're not just capturing just images, you're capturing the sound, you're capturing interviews. Because a lot of times you go, we'll go out there as photojournalists, we might not have a reporter. So we have to, we, we do it all. We cover everything. It's being able to anticipate what's going to be going on next. It's hectic. It's hectic for us to get our story done on time. If you're trying to run around town and get the best shots and the best visuals of, of what this, this rain is doing, but you still have to make it back to the station in time to, to do your story. So we experience some unique challenges. Well, when it first happens, you're saying to yourself, you talk to management, you say, do we want to do a cut-in? 
because flash flood warnings means that there's definitely some flooding going on. It's a, situ it's, a, it's a dangerous situation. We've had a lot of rain dumping over one particular area. The warnings come out. They tell us exactly where they're at. But the first thing we want to do is get the information out to the public and then look at the situation. Definitely when monsoon season starts, it's, it's a bigger deal. But we know that we're definitely going to get some rain. We're going to get some thunderstorms. We're going to have to deal with some flash flooding. So definitely monsoon season becomes a critical situation for us. We know it's going to, we know we're going to get some rain and it's just a matter of how much rain we get at once and will it lead to flash flooding and flash flood warnings. Last August when we had a huge storm um, come through, Henderson was underwater again. I think what surprises you about covering a flash flood is how fast it happens, how rapidly it changes and how bold and brazen people can be. You see people in tiny cars, big cars, try to barrel through the water and you see them lose, and they do. And I think that's part of our unique predicament that our valley is in. It doesn't rain often, but when it does, it comes down hard, it comes down fast. And what's amazing is if you're trying to get where you're going, people will try to, to drive through. Over the years, we've seen firsthand how much damage flooding can cause. Neighborhoods devastated by flood water, roadways mangled and cars overturned by rushing water, even entire houses crumbling after a flood ripped through them. Though we've made a lot of progress in our mission to control that flood water, it's important to remember what Mother Nature can do. Whenever the rain does come down in this valley, you know, especially back then, we all knew where, where all the flooding spots were. Imperial Palace, Charleston, just almost anywhere you knew where it was at, boom, you knew where to go. But Miracle Mile was kind of new, uh, area. We just heard over the scanners it was getting really bad over there, drove up on a live truck, and you could just see the whole embankment eroding away. I sat there watching, I'm like going, man, this thing's going to go in any second. I can feel it. I just set my camera up and I said, I'm just going to roll tape, just put the, put the record button on, and I sat back in a live truck, watching on my monitor, all of a sudden... Uh, when that gallon rainbow, that intersection, when that flooded out, um, the whole flood channel there, and seeing the fire truck, uh, the, the famous fire trucks being rescued by Metro Air Support, uh, and then going in to that neighborhood for the next two or three days, going through the houses, seeing them covered knee high with mud, and just seeing everyone's lives just completely changed by rain. My days when I first started out, you'd go down there, the entire block behind Imperial Palace would be flooded out. I mean, people would be standing up on top of vehicles. They had uh, one year fire trucks going out over some of the roads there trying to pick people off their vehicles. And in, these are apartment complexes all behind the Imperial Palace. And it just was every single road there was a river flooding into the Flamingo Wash. And it would just spill off in there, but there was never any control about it whatsoever. And it was just constant flooding. I mean, you can go anywhere. And of course, Charleston was always the, the best one to go to because it, it would flood up, what, 14, 15 feet high. And uh, there you go. But you also had uh, Industrial Road also in around the Sahara area, which was really bad. Many of the historic flooding hotspots have all but vanished due to the Regional Flood Control District's work, but that doesn't mean the danger of flooding has disappeared. Flood water is always unsafe, no matter who you are. But it's about just conveying the message. It's about going, yes, going into areas that people outside of news really probably shouldn't be there, and we probably really shouldn't be there. It's, it's you know, it's always, you kind of laugh about it, and you see these huge storms come in, but yet TV stations send the reporters out there to go stand right in the middle of it. These are the people that go out there and they'll bring the message. And yes, there is, there could be life and limb, but going out of flooded areas, going to areas like that, that are inherently dangerous, yeah. It's, it's gonna be kind of hairy, but you know, that's the job we do, that's the job we chose to do. It's also devastating. We saw a young man, 17 years old, uh, last August. He was getting ready to start his senior year at Green Valley and he was near the channel. Somehow he got sucked in and um, his body was found at Sam Boyd Stadium. So the water is real and it, it can be an, an enemy and it can leave families devastated. By the time we had heard that Will Moots had fallen in and was missing, it was too late. So it's not something you, you play with, and that's why you have to learn from experiences in the past. And if we plant that seed and we, we teach that lesson before we get to that terrible day in the city, hopefully we've reached someone before it's too late.
I believe it was the Pittman Wash, where we came across some kids that were playing around on an air mattress, just riding like they were riding a raft down the river. At the very same time we're reporting the death of a child, there was a group of teenagers who had a mattress and they're moving down this channel like it was their own water park. And while that video is funny and it's outrageous and, and, and no one was, was hurt, it was blowing our minds to see someone make that kind of risk when we saw someone lose. You can't see what's under the water. Um, and on the surface, it looked like a class five rapid. Um, being on an air mattress, no strap down, just kind of floating along. Something was about to happen. I wasn't about to cover someone who just fell off an air mattress. By that point, we already had one teenager that was lost in the Pittman wash. I didn't want to see another one. In that situation, we got a hold of Metro's air unit to let them know, hey, this is what's going on, uh, keeping in constant contact with the other helicopters and Metro Air Unit. And their air unit flew overhead and yelled at them on their PA, and as soon as they were overhead, and you can see them getting out of the wash. We don't see a lot of rain in our valley, but many times when it rains, it also floods. And every time it floods, we see video of people making bad decisions in flood water. Whether it's driving through a flooded intersection, getting too close to a flowing channel, or playing in a flooded roadway, people need to be reminded of how dangerous flood water can be and what it's capable of destroying. It's definitely breaking news whenever it rains here um, because of the ground, because of the soil. Um, and living here long enough, knowing that just because it's raining on the west side of town and the east side of town is dry, doesn't mean that the east side of town is not gonna flood out. Give it an hour or so, it's all gonna make its way down that way and it's all good at the same place. It's hard because there's intrigue. When it rains that much, that fast, people are fascinated. They want to get a closer look. They're drawn to that fast moving channel. And so it is hard to tell people to stay away, especially when sometimes we put ourselves in arguably dangerous situations as well, to try to get as close to that water to give our viewers a glimpse. So it can be hard and not everyone listens. And that's probably the toughest part about covering extreme weather, we're trying to get a message across, yet we're sometimes doing the very thing we're telling people not to do. So the media has an important role and it's a balance. As a photojournalist, you go out there, you know the, the dangers are inherent that you're going to be around, especially flooding. You go out there and you're conveying a message to people. This is where it's at, keep away. You know when it's flooding, these are the areas to keep away from. And in all my years, it's just so funny, I still watch people run through water. It's like, aren't you watching TV? Don't you see it's a problem? Stay out of it. And But yet still people do it. But we still have to keep going out there and conveying that message. It's, it's almost, it's almost like you, you know, you're beating your head into a wall, but you have to go out there and keep doing it. You, keep on, you have to keep showing to people, don't do this. It is bad. These are the areas. Stay out. I, I've always said that photojournalists are, we document history. And if my video out there that I've shot through my, my career, almost what, going on 25 years, and going out to these floods, these different areas, if that video helps the flood control district get their message out, I've done my job. It's only fitting that we end our best of show at the largest project of the district's history. And there's been a lot of progress made here since the last time we visited. So let's take a look back at what this project used to look like. It's hard to believe that this is a golf course, but this is what Desert Rose looked like in 2012 after a flash flood. Even though the district had identified improvements here and started to design them, Mother Nature didn't wait. A landscaper working at the course was swept downstream and killed. Numerous homes flooded and thousands of people were put in harm's way. The storm reminded us how badly this area needed flood control improvements. Construction began in November. This is the largest project of the Flood Control District um, since its inception. Um, it's a Las Vegas wash uh, project from Sloan Channel to Bonanza, as well as including the Flamingo Wash from the confluence of the Las Vegas wash to Nellis. Um, this project is such a huge magnitude. As you can see behind us, a lot of activity going on, but it's basically having to be broken down into, into separate pieces because it's actually um, un in included with the Desert Rose Golf Course. So in order to meet certain time frames and, and get the golf course open as soon as we possibly can, 
the project was broken up into, into many multiple phases and actually includes many multiple areas, the way the contractor is working. The district has authorized $50 million for construction here, showing just how critical this project is. In November of uh, 2011, 1,700 homes and structures were put into the uh, FEMA floodplain. So what we had to do was we came out and monitored what was going on with the Las Vegas wash and the Flamingo wash, and we determined that there was actually very little capacity in the existing facility. Before we can install flood control, contractors have to dig, pump out water, and dig some more. Crews are removing more than 4,000 cubic yards of dirt each day. And they're running 22 trucks um, a day, or just constantly cycling through. And as you can see behind me, as they fill them up, they probably take about three minutes to get them full, and then they're off, and the next truck's waiting in line. So they're, they're just constantly rolling through these, and they're, and they're taking material out of here as fast as they possibly can at this point. It's a lot of activity and a lot of noise, but neighbors don't mind. Judy Moss lives in Winterwood Village and has seen some terrible flooding. Uh, the one from last summer brought in the gravel and the rocks from the wash right up to my house. Uh, through the fence, still have gravel there today from it. And, and you had flooding at your house? Yes, it, uh, it separated my house. So the area we're looking at here in the last um, major storm event. There used to be a, uh, a, a golf cart bridge somewhere in the neighborhood of where the excavator is right now. What that wound up doing is it backed up the water and forced the water into that development, as well as the water from Sahara also backed up. So the flood that happened last summer, we would probably have been standing in about eight feet of water at this point right here. About 1,700 homeowners were placed in a flood zone by FEMA. They have to buy flood insurance right now and their rates aren't cheap. The district will continue to talk with FEMA and exchange information about the project as it moves along. Our design um, is, is to remove the entire flood zone and keep it contained within the Las Vegas wash and the Flamingo wash. So we've submitted the conditional letter of map revision that sh states that and it shows FEMA that and we're in the process right now um, they're in review of that, and we believe that we should have no big hiccups and that that should get approved as is. So as long as we construct it in accordance with what we sent to them, we, we have every intention that this will be removed from the flood zone. That means a lot of work. Two washes flow into Desert Rose and they flow out under Sahara Avenue. A larger flood channel will be built under Sahara, and that means the bridge over the golf course will have to be rebuilt and Sahara will close for about six months. The district has worked with the city, county, and schools to make sure everyone can make it through during the construction. The city of Las Vegas has a 72-inch sewer line that they're actually going to, that we had to relocate as well as increase the capacity and we're putting a 104-inch sewer line for the city of Las Vegas through the golf course. And a lot of these things had to be coordinated and done because we actually, the channel actually gets excavated below those. So we have to get the sewer lines in place prior to us fully excavating out to create the capacity. Crews will also rebuild the golf course when they're finished below. Just to give you a perspective of how the golf course is being, has been re redesigned to be laid out with the channel. The channel, as you can see, kind of, it curves through here, but it, as you go upstream, it's actually more meanders through. And what that allowed the golf course designer to do was to pull the tee boxes and the greens further away from the neighboring developments and have them hit towards the center of the channel where we have designated landing areas for them. The landing areas will be similar to what we see over here. We take the low flow and we put it in a pipe and then we're gonna have the, the fairways over top of them, but they still convey the, the, the channel capacity over top of those low flows. So those are specifically designed for landing areas for the golfers. They're hitting away from the homes and not necessarily towards the homes. So it should make it more safe for the golfer as well as make it more safe for the residents along the golf course. Yeah, you can see along the pop marks along the houses, so we're hoping to, to help eliminate that. I don't think you can design for all the bad golfers in the world, <laughs> but we'll try to help it. <laughs> when this project is finished, it will look like a golf course again, and the entire area will have more capacity for flood water, and that flood water will stay in the channel that's being built right now. The purpose of this project is really demonstrates the fact that this really is a flood conveyance facility first. You know, the floods we had last summer, as well as what we have to do to actually create the capacity for the 100-year flow, really shows that it is a flood control facility first and foremost. 
So once we were able to design that and we had the area around it, it, it really it really benefited the community to be able to come in here and actually add a golf, enhance the golf course to it and make it a better experience for both. You know, once we were able to contain the floodwaters, everybody will have a much better experience on here and, uh, and, and it should be great for the entire community. As an engineer, as well as a public um, employee, it really makes me feel good to be able to do something that's really gonna have a benefit to the community. I mean, and, 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 and everything that we can do to help the contractor move as fast as he can has really been beneficial as a team of all of us to be able to keep this moving forward. I mean, it's really, it really feels good to be able to, to, to move as fast as we can, spend taxpayers' dollars wisely, and get them a huge benefit for, for, for this particular area. We've seen our fair share of wet weather this year, but the district has been hard at work protecting residents from flooding. And that's going to do it for this best of edition of the Flood Channel. You can always find more information on our website, www.regionalflood.org. And remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and download our free Floodspot app so you're ready the next time it rains.